Welcome to the Bridge Fellowship Online. We are so glad that you are here, and we hope that this message encourages you today. To find more information about our church or future events, go to tbfonline.net. Bridge Fellowship, good morning. Uh, I have another announcement of sad news um, because as our next gen pastor, I get to oversee uh, our intern program, and this summer we've had four college students with us uh, that have done just an amazing, phenomenal job investing in our kids' ministry, in our student ministry, uh, and if you serve in those areas, if you serve in our kids' ministry, you have had an opportunity and a chance to work with Andy and Gracie. If you have been in our student ministry, you have seen and been a part of everything that Carson and Tori have helped lead and be a part of. So uh, today is their last day. They're going back to school because they're college students, and they have a degree to pursue, and, and uh, many of them are pursuing vocational ministry. Um, and so if you see the, one of those four today, uh, would you just encourage them, uh, tell them thank you for being here, hug their neck, um, and just send them off well, pray over them, something. And, uh, and then this semester, just and as you think of what God is doing in our kids' ministry and our student ministry here, let that be a reminder to pray for the four of them um, and what they're pursuing and what God is doing in their life. And man, it's going to be uh, another great summer next year. Uh, I'm already looking forward to that. And I would also invite you to pray for us in that. And you'll think, man, that's a long ways away. Yeah, no, which gives us a lot of time to pray for the right students and college students to join us in this ministry because it's important. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. But this morning, we're going to dive in and we're going to jump back into and kind of finish up this Regen series uh, as we continue to look at the hope given and, and, and healing that we see uh, God do in Luke chapter eight. And so if you got a copy of God's word, you can start chasing that down, Luke chapter eight. But uh, we're gonna pick up where Pastor P left off last week. And if you were not here, just a brief reminder, uh, it's an incredible story. It's, it's quick in the text, you can read it. Uh, but Jesus and some of his disciples, they go across the sea. They're in a city called Capernaum. They get in a boat and they go across uh, the sea, the lake, and, and they find themselves in a, a, a graveyard, really, and a man possessed of demons and a, a legion of demons, a lot of demons, and God heals this man. Um, and it's, it's a beautiful story of redemption and healing and uh, restoration and regeneration. And then Jesus and, and his disciples, they get back in the boat and they go back to Capernaum. So that's kind of, kind of what we're going to see happen this morning as we kind of dive into the text. We're going to see Jesus show back at, get, get back to Capernaum, and there's going to be this crowd that, that arrives, and they're going to be waiting for Jesus. They know he's coming back, they can see him in the distance, and they begin to kind of gather uh, there. And as Jesus comes off the boat, these people are pressing in, and they're, they're trying to find him, they want to see him do a, a miracle, they want to see him perform something and heal someone, and, and, and they're just attracted to him, they're watching him, they're seeing him do ministry. And the thing about Capernaum, if you don't understand how cities were ran back then, uh, a lot of times, it was a huge city, but uh, every city kind of had a, a synagogue like, centered in the city. And, and a priest would lead that synagogue, and they would teach the law, and they would teach people. It was a place of worship. And the man that was in charge of this synagogue, the leader there, this, the, was a man by the name of Jairus. And we're going to see him in the text in a second. We're going to read about him. Um, but to understand kind of his role, he was a really important guy. People followed him, people listened to him, he taught people, people knew who he was. And in this moment, we're gonna see what happens when, when this Pharisee, if you would, just, he was, Jairus was a Pharisee, which if you're not familiar with what Pharisees are, they're very anti-Jesus. So these thousands of people are pressing in, they're, they're wanting to see Jesus do a miracle, and they're following his ministry, and they're seeing what he's doing, and whether it be for the right reason or the wrong reason, man, they are all in, they're watching every move that Jesus makes. There's this other group called the Pharisees who are completely opposed to that. And they're the ones who are running the synagogues and they were the teachers of the time. And Jairus was one of those Pharisees. So he was the ruling party of Israel. They were very anti-Jesus. And, and, and they thought that he was, they thought Jesus was a weirdo. They thought Jesus was a nut job. They thought he was a trickster. They thought he was kind of like in for the show and kind of just kind of very performance-based and wouldn't, wouldn't totally sold in these miracles. And, and so they, they began to, get weary and you have to understand that. The reason that's important is because as we read this text, we have to understand who Jairus is because he's a religious leader, but he doesn't believe in Jesus. And so while he's religious, he's, he's not a Christ follower, but he begins to wonder, just like everybody else, who is this Jesus guy? And he's going to have an interaction with Jesus that we're going to see in just a moment. But Jairus also wasn't just a religious leader. He wasn't just a Pharisee. He was also a husband and a dad. He had a daughter that we're gonna see in this text, a 12-year-old daughter uh, that grows sick. She gets, she gets ill and she falls uh, 
stick to her bed to, to a point of she's on her deathbed. And, and Jairus, as a religious leader, he's, he's known. Like, like they, were, they were known by people. And like not only, not only was he known and people saw him and, and, and sat under his teaching, but because of the stature that he had and the leadership in the community he had, he had resources. Like he could call on a lawyer, he'd call on a scribe, he could call on, on, a, on, a, on a doctor. Like anything he wanted, Jairus had at his disposal because of the position he held in the community. And not only the position he held, but the finances. Like he could pay for anything he needed. And so everything was at his disposal. And so as his daughter grows sick, he doesn't need Jesus, right? He doesn't need him because he has all these resources in the community that he can get what he needs when he needs it. And so I can imagine as, as she gets sicker and more sick and more sick and more sick, that he's reaching out and he's calling on these resources and he's bringing in the doctors and he's bringing in the specialists and he's bringing in the, the, the mourners and, the, and, and this whole thing is happening and he's trying to solve a problem that he doesn't have the answer to. Sound familiar? And what happens, she, she gets so sick that, that Jairus, in all his, of his power and all of his wealth and all of his influence, he's turned to everybody that he knows except for the person that can actually heal his daughter. And his name is Jesus. <laughs> and as we read these stories and, this, and, and, and Jesus is going around and he's, and he's calming the storm and he's casting out demons and he's healing the sick and he's raising people from the dead. He's giving sight to the blind. Yet Jesus, or Jairus, is still, he's watching this happen. He's seeing Jesus do all this stuff and yet he still finds himself in a position of pride and of arrogance and of, of, of I don't need that guy. These people are weirdos that are following this man. And I can do this on my own. I can do this with my own power. Those people are gullible. They're a bunch of losers, a bunch of low lives. I don't need the Jesus guy. I have everything I need right here. However, there comes a turn in, in, the, in the scripture when things go really desperate and things go really grim and, and dark. And Chiris has to make a decision on what he's gonna do. It's interesting that nothing's changed. <laughs> Jairus finds himself in the most desperate position and he is about to do anything he can do to get the healing that his daughter needs. You, you, you guys are familiar with Jairus' story, aren't you? That you will do anything you can do for your family. You will do whatever it takes to see the next thing through. That you have found yourself in a position that you never thought you would find yourself in because of your desperateness. You found yourself having conversations with people and saying things that you would have never ever thought you would ever say because of your family and the needs you have and, and you're so desperate. We will put ourselves in any position any conversation, any work, like we'll overwork, we'll underwork, we'll say things, we'll do things. And, and some of those things are really beneficial. <laughs> and we make the right decision. And we have the right conversation. We go see the right doctor. We have, and we go see and make the right moves in our life. We change things, we remove things. Most of the time, we start out by making really poor decisions. Because we're just as human as Jairus is and we want control. And we have this pride in our life that says, I am going to fix this. Until things grow desperate. Until we can't. Until we've exhausted every possible resource that we have at our disposal and nothing's working and nothing's changing and yet we're still sick, we're still depressed, we're still anxious, we're still sitting in a broken marriage and yet there's nothing that I can do to fix it. That's exactly where Jairus is in this moment. He's exhausted every resource. And the only thing that's left is the very thing, the very person of Jesus and it's gonna cost him everything. Because he's... Because he is a Pharisee. And, and, and the Pharisees, are the, they're anti-Jesus. They're, they're, they're very, they're opposed to his cause. They're the ones, right? The very person that Jairus says is a Pharisee, that group of people, if you're not familiar with it, they're the ones who killed Jesus. And so in this moment of desperateness, Jairus has to make a decision. Am I gonna lay down my life? Am I gonna lay down my career? My ministry? finances, 
my name. Because if he does what he's about to do, and we're going to see that he does, everything goes away for him. But we'll do anything in a desperate moment, won't we? Like, if you don't believe me, if you can't look at your life and see you do desperate things and dumb things for, out, of, out of desperateness, look at our country. <laughs> Show me a historical tragedy that following it, you do not see a spike in church attendance. Every national tragedy follows up with a spike in church attendance because we're desperate and we're longing for an answer and we will look for anything and everything. And people who say that they would never do this or never do that, they're gonna show up to places and have conversations and do things that they would have never found themselves in out of desperateness. And Jairus finds himself reaching out and calling out to the name of Jesus, somebody he would have never ever reached out to out of complete desperateness. Stand with me as we read Luke chapter eight, if you're able to. I mean, Luke chapter eight, verse 40. If you're able to stand with me, thank you for standing. This is what the word of God says. He says, now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him. For they were all expecting him. And then a man by the name of Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet. Pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12 years, was dying. And Jesus was, was, as Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. We're going to continue this passage as we go on, but I want to pray for us this morning. God, thank you for your word. God, what an honor and a privilege that it is to be able to stand here and teach your word and your truth, God, as you continue to reveal things in my own life as I stand here this morning and preach. God, I pray that our hearts and our minds and our soul would be open and ready to receive truth from you. It's in the authority of your word that we pray these things. Amen. Hey, thank you for standing. What I want us to see this morning, a few things that I believe that this passage, there's a lot of things I think we need to let go of, but I think this passage makes three things very clear to us that we need to let go of in order to see God move in our life. In order for us to see God perform miracles in our life, in order to see the hand of God heal our life and the people around us, there are some things that we're gonna have to let go of. And as we look at the life of Jairus, three of those things are, are, are control and fear and the noise. And so we're gonna break those down. The first thing we're gonna let go of if we wanna see God move in our life is control. And that's exactly what Jairus does. He lets go of everything. He lets go of control. He falls down at the feet of Jesus in front of the entire city and says, Lord, I need you to, I need you to heal my daughter. Teacher, Jesus, Lord, heal my daughter. And if you're like, what's the big deal about it? Have you not listened to anything I've said yet this morning? He's a religious leader. He's a, he's a Pharisee. He does not believe in Jesus. If he says what he just said, like at this moment, right now, he begs, he gets down on his knees, he says, Jesus, I need you to heal my daughter. I need you to heal her. I'm desperate. And in that moment, everything's over for Jairus. He no longer is a leader in this synagogue. He no longer is making what he's making. He no longer has the resources that he has at his disposal because everybody else in that part of life and what he does, these other religious they're going to send him out. He's done. And in that moment, he makes a decision. I don't care. I'm no longer in control. Some of you right now in this room, you are in a marriage that is broken, and it, is, it, it, is, it is not well, and you are, you are, you're fighting with each other, and you're at a brink of divorce, and you're trying to control the narrative. And it's not going to work if you continue to have control and try to fix it on your own. You have to set your marriage at the feet of Jesus. There are some of you in this room right now that you've put yourself in that position financially or it has happened outside of your circumstances. But right now, you are sitting in this room not sure where your mortgage is gonna come from. You do not know how you're gonna pay the next bill. You have no idea how you're gonna get rid of credit card debt. You have no idea what is next for you financially. And all you're doing, you're gonna go pick up another job and you're gonna go do this and you're gonna do side job and you're gonna sweat bullets and you're gonna come home and you're gonna complain and you're gonna be full of fear and you're gonna be full of anxiety and you're gonna be desperate for some answer. Listen to me. Let go of control. Some of you, know someone or you are ill 
like you, you were going to the doctor, getting answers that you don't want to hear. And, and I, I love that we live in 2023. And I believe that God put on people's hearts to create medicine and doctors and the technology we have. And I am all about modern, modern medicine. Like, let's use what God has given someone's brain to create. But you're not getting the answers that you want to receive. And so you go to a specialist and you go to a second opinion and you go to a third opinion. And all God's trying to tell you is, hey, look, man, I know it doesn't look like you uh, are, are in a safe and healthy space right now, but I need you to let go and trust me. I'm not saying don't go to the doctors. I'm saying in the moment receiving the news, you have got to let go of control. And trust him. Some of you have in your, right now are in the midst of trauma. Some of you have walked through it in your past. And you are trying to fix the problem to, to trauma and to pain in your life. And to do it, you're trying to ignore the pain and ignore the trauma by filling your life with things that are not of God. And you fill your life with a broken marriage and complaining about somebody else. And then you go find it in pornography. And then you go find it in drugs, right? And then you go find it in, in anxiety. And you go chase after an addiction. And you go chase after loneliness. And you isolate yourself and say, they're not gonna be able to fix it. So I'm just gonna kind of sit in my own little thing. And I'm not gonna talk to anybody about it. I'm not gonna address the problem. And, to, and you have a problem, you have a trauma in your life that cannot go undressed. And yet to fix it, you're not talking about it. You're not letting people in your life. You're isolating yourself. And you're trying to control your trauma on your own with more pain and more darkness and more brokenness. And all Jesus is saying is let go. Let go of it. And trust me. And this is where Jairus is in that moment. As I look at the story of Jairus, he's trying to control the crisis. Or he wasn't. He, he was. And he finally breaks and says, I'm, I can't. I cannot control the crisis. I cannot control the trauma. I cannot control the brokenness. And what we also have to see and understand is we cannot control the crisis. We have to surrender the crisis. Stop trying to control it and let go of it. And Jairus throws caution to the wind. He throws control aside. He says, Jesus, you are the only thing that I've not tried and it's going to cost me everything. It's going to cost Jairus his career. It's going to cost him his family name. It's going to cost him resources. And yet he forfeits control of everything. For what? I'm going to let go of control. I'm going to let Jesus handle all the situations that, 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 that I have to, to get burned. For him to not do the very thing that I'm asking him to do. Like look at the text. And, and next week, Phil's going to come back and he's going to share the piece of scripture that we're going to kind of skip over so we can continue to chase after Jairus' story. But in this moment, I'm going I'm to surrender control to Jesus so that he can get distracted? I'm going to surrender control of my life so that he can get interrupted? And so that this messenger, this servant, Jairus, in the middle of all this, he finally surrenders control and says, you can have everything. I just need you to heal my daughter. And then this woman comes up to Jesus and begins to ask for healing. And it's this whole situation is going to be an amazing thing. Don't miss next week. But it stops Jesus for a long enough time for a messenger, a servant to, to show up to Jairus, running from the home to say, hey, Jairus, it's over. She didn't make it. Like, leave the teacher alone. You don't need him anymore. She's gone. <laughs> and yet, what does Jesus do? Because if there's any hope that I can tell you, look at verse 40, 49, it tells us. He says, your daughter's dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. Maybe you feel like that right now in your situation. You tried, you let go of control, and God didn't show up. He didn't do what you asked him to do. He didn't, he didn't do what you wanted to do. He didn't heal what you thought he was going to heal. Can I tell you something? He's not distracted. Hey, Jesus doesn't get interrupted. 
He's exactly where he wants to be, doing exactly what he wants to do, exactly where he's doing it at. He's not distracted. He doesn't get interrupted. He knows exactly where you are, and he has you right where he wants you. All he's asking you to do is to let go of control and trust me. And he's overhearing this conversation because he can hear all, knows all, and sees all at all times. And as they're talking, as he's getting this message, he's listening, he's watching Jairus receive the news. As it breaks him, as he responds as any parent would, he drops his head and begins to weep and to mourn at the loss of the news that his daughter's gone. <laughs> and then, Jair, or then Jesus says this. This is how Jesus responds. He says, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just believe and she will be healed. Right, if we're, if we're going to see God move in our life, we have to let go of control and we have to let go of fear. We have to let go of fear. What are you so afraid of? What are you so afraid of? What's keeping you from letting go? People knowing and finding things out and hearing your story, knowing what's going on in your life. I'm going to invite a very dear friend of mine. Um, a coworker of mine, someone that I love to give a hard time to, uh, but her name is Mary Dowdy, and she is on staff with us. And I want to ask her a few questions about her fears and her experience with Regents. So would you guys help me welcome Mary Dowdy to the stage? Wow, that's that's the best one so far. This is your hey, this is your team right here. This is your team. Uh, Mary Dowdy is uh, serves as our business office coordinator. Uh, she takes care of us, makes sure things are in line, uh, mainly. Her main responsibility is to make sure that I don't act a fool all the time. Which means, she corrects me a lot, which means I give her the hardest time. But um, That's a big job. Yeah. Uh, what are some of your biggest fears, Mary? Uh, actually, right now, being on stage with you, <laughs> being interviewed by you, I just man. never know what uh, you're going to say. <laughs> oh, man. In first service, I, I, she should tell you that she's scared of elevators. Because she got stuck in our elevator one time in this building. It was amazing. Uh, yeah. uh, our security system doesn't have sound. Uh, so I told her in first service, I was like, if I had sound, I'd put it on the screen. And then I was like, no, I'm just kidding. I'll put it up here. She freaked out. It was great. Uh, Joseph pulled it. Here it is. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm, uh, not I'm not surprised. I know. I know. But anyway, uh, what are some real fears that you have that, that you struggle with? Um... <clears throat> One of my biggest fears is um, my kids um, not being healthy and happy and um, walking away from their faith. Um, I think just as moms, that's just one of, one of the biggest fears that we face. And um, another one is um, that I can let distractions in this world um, pull me away from who God wants me to be mm. and have to get back on track and... And yeah. just remember who I am in yeah. him. Yeah. Um, so we're in a region series, and we've kind of done this each week. But I, I want to you to share uh, with them why you, why you originally committed to region this last year. So um, last year, uh, our whole staff went to the first region graduation. And it was extremely emotional watching all the life change and people that the stories were just unreal. It was very emotional for me. And um, so I went home that night and I told my husband, David, I thought that maybe this would be uh, something that he could go through because he had been struggling with some stuff for a long time. Um, and I told him that I'd go with him and I would support him and be there for him. And lo and behold, um, <laughs> God had other plans. So... Um, you can't just go and support somebody in the program. You actually have to do the work yourself, uh, which is a lot of work. Say that again. <laughs> Say that again. You have to do the work. Right. If you're going to support someone, if you're going to be the church, if you're going to walk with someone through their brokenness, if you're going to walk someone through their pain, you can't just encourage someone. You're going to have to do some work in your own life, too. Exactly. And I did. <laughs> and I'm glad I did. It, it, it turned out to be a great, yeah. a great experience. But you quickly found out, okay, we're going to be in a different group. Yes. I'm not going to be doing what I thought I was doing. No. Why did you stay? When you found out that you weren't going to be able to be there just for Dave, and you're going to kind of have your own group, why did you keep walking through it? 
Uh, well, actually, I went home that night, and I had thought to myself on the way home, there's no way I'm going to do this. I am not going back next week. It's 40 weeks. It, it sounds like so much work. And I just, yeah, I, that was what I had thought I, I had decided. Um, so I just decided to pray about it for that week. And um, I just felt like the Lord was leading me to come back next, the next, the following Tuesday um, and just uh, learn it, what, what it was all about. And um, so I decided to go back and I did. It's amazing what will happen if you fast and ask the Lord to reveal something to yes. you. Um, so 40 weeks, God not only worked through in David's life, but also in your own life. Mm-hmm. And you questioned whether you were going to go back the next week and you finished 40 weeks. Um, and now as you, you, you sit down, I asked Mary if she would do this interview and she was like, no. And so I just continued to ask her, I said, <laughs> you should pray about that one. Um, so she did again. And she said, okay, I'll do it. Um, but when we were talking about it, she talked about how not only did she go through it, not only did she stay through it. But she was going to go back and be a co-leader in, in August, like when we launch it in just a few weeks. Um, so I asked her if she would share with you guys why she's going to go back and, and lead as a leader. So Regen became a really huge part of my life for nine months, um, coming every week um, and, doing it, and doing all the work. And um, I met some absolutely amazing women, my life, my leader, Marty. Um, I just... And I had prayed before that for God to bring me a new group of friends um, here at church. And uh, he definitely delivered on that with all these women. And um, I just, in this program, I watched so many people, not just in my group, but in all the groups um, at Regen, just have amazing life changes. Um, And so I just felt like I needed to give back um, what I got out of it. And if I could help one person uh, break some of those chains and those struggles that they have in their life, um, then those 40 weeks are like one day. It's, it was, it's definitely worth it. So good. Um, man, this is why she's up here. This is it right here. Um, so she's a friend. She's family to me, but, um, and also... She is facing one of her greatest fears being up here with me. So would you guys thank Mary for being here this morning? One more thing. Oh. (laughs) Come on, Mary. Share it with them. Um, Just one more thing that if you are on the fence about Regen, it sounds like it's it's scary, and it is, uh, but you will just get so much out of it, and you will have an amazing group of friends, and God will show you so many things that you never really even thought about or considered in your life and um, just jump off that fence and, and join. And if you need some encouragement for it, give me a call. I answer the phones here. Um, <laughs> I, I, will, I will be there for you on that first night. So. Come on, let's do it. Mary Dowdy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for fear to freedom, right? That's it. That's Regen in a nutshell. They're like, they're, it is not going to be easy for you to show up because you're going to have to share things. You're going to open up. You're going to expose yourself and let people see something that you don't want them to see. But if you will do that, if you will release control, if you will let go of control, if you let go of your fears, he's going to take you from fear and anxiety and brokenness to freedom. Um, and I, there are things that I'm scared of in my, in my life. Um, and one of the biggest things that I struggle with is very superficial, uh, but it's a, for, it's a real fear. Like I'm, my palms are sweating just thinking about telling you what I'm scared of. Um, but I, one of my biggest fear in life is going to the dentist. Uh, and I'm, this is me making a lot of the situation because I don't want to go the rest of the text because that's hard. So I'm just going to cover it up with humor. <laughs> but I don't like the dentist, okay? Um, I have an amazing dentist that helps that. And do the amazing team, all right? So if, you don't, if you're new and you need a dentist, go to Brian Atkinson. He's phenomenal. I love that dude. He makes me laugh on there, but he also takes care of me. So, um, but that doesn't help what he has to do to my teeth, okay? And that is what I fear. Not Brian and his team, but my teeth. And I, my, my palms sweat thinking about it right now. Because you got to go in and you got to let them take a picture of you with like a 12-year-old webcam and 
That's weird. That just starts off weird. It just starts weird. Give me all your information. Take a webcam photo. It's weird. And because you also know every time you walk in that, the lady at the front desk is going to see that like half smile, like not ready photo of you. Okay. (laughs) Then I have to sit down in a chair and wait for them to call my name. And the whole time I'm hearing the noises in the back, (laughs) you know, knowing, knowing that that's about to be me. And I hate that. I hate every second of it. Um, no, in all seriousness, the reason, but here's the truth, okay? We're talking through this. We're like, how can we be funny? This is a dentist. And as we were talking through this in critique, you, like, that was supposed to just be a funny story and we we're gonna move on. But you know why I fear the dentist? Because I know what they're gonna find. I know what they're gonna find. Because I don't eat good. I eat junk food. I have popcorn kernels stuck in my teeth from like a month ago. That's a true story. That's why I went to Brian in the first place. I thought I was going to have to get dentures, and it was just a popcorn kernel. (laughs) But I don't like going to the dentist because I know what they're going to find. And there's some of us in this space right now that we don't want to go to Regen. We don't want to. We don't want to confide in people who we know love Jesus. We don't want to go to the name of Jesus because we know what He's going to find, and that scares you. And all he's asking you to do, look, hey, he knows what you're doing. Jesus already knows where your marriage is. Jesus already knows where your life is. He already knows what you're thinking. He already knows what you deal with. He already knows the, 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 the pills that you take that you shouldn't be taking. He already knows the stuff that you're drinking that you shouldn't be drinking. Like, why are you afraid of telling Jesus what's going on in your life when he already knows? All he's asking you to do is to trust him to say, I'm gonna tell you what you already know and I need you to ask and, and, and come to him before him and say, here's my control, here's my fear and I need you to heal me. And that's exactly where Jairus is. And, and, and man, in the middle of all this, the truth and reality is some of you are walking through the same thing that Jairus is walking through right now. There is news on the table. There are seasons of your life that you're in right now. You're walking through tragedy. You're walking in fear. You're walking in loneliness. You're getting news that you're, that you're not pregnant. You're getting news that your dad is gone. You're getting news that your family is moving out of town that you see every single day, right? There's, you're getting news that you no longer have a job tomorrow. Like, I understand that my superficial fear of the dentist is irrelevant to the conversation that's happening in this text. Jairus' daughter is dead. And what does Jesus do? He doesn't freak out. He doesn't panic. He doesn't go into hysteria. Jairus' head falls and he begins to weep and he begins to mourn the loss of his daughter because he just cried out to the name of Jesus to say, I need you to heal my daughter. And in that moment, his job's gone, his name is gone, his resources are gone, and his daughter is dead. And yet Jesus looks him in the face and says, I need you to trust me. I need you to believe me. If Jesus doesn't freak out and panic in these moments, neither should we. And I know that's really hard to hear in the middle of that. And you're thinking, you have no idea what I'm walking through. And I understand that. And with much love and compassion and grace that I can tell you, that statement rings true. If Jesus doesn't panic in hopeless situations, we should not either. And yet there Jairus is needing to put fear aside if he was gonna place his faith in Jesus. Because fear and faith, they don't go together. And some of us need to understand that if we're gonna really trust Jesus, we have to set fear down. Because we're not going to believe and be afraid at the same time. Right, you cannot try to believe and also figure it out on your own. You cannot believe in the name of Jesus and say, here's my control, here's my fear, and say that you are going to believe, and yet you're still trying to make sense of the delay that Jesus has. He says, only believe. Well, no, you don't know my story. You don't know what happened last week. I lost my job. I lost my wife. I lost my family. My kids didn't make the team. My kids didn't make the whatever. They're not gonna make friends or a new school. And you begin to have these real fears and brokenness in your life. Only believe. See, Jairus had tried everything. And the only thing, the only thing that Jairus had to believe in was Jesus' word. 
Everything else told Jairus that his daughter was gone and she wasn't coming back. And yet Jesus says, I need you to believe. But you know what doesn't change in this moment? His situation does not change. He is still getting pressed in on by a crowd. Like think of New Year's Eve, Times Square. And just because he finds out that Jesus is there, and just because he cries out and says, I need you to heal my daughter, and just because he gets news that his daughter's dead, and Jesus brings all the hope that he could possibly give, which is, I just need you to believe. That's all Jesus is asking you to do, is believe. You have one job. It is not to figure out your problems. It is not to take control. It is not to be afraid. It is not to listen to the noise. All Jesus is asking you to do is believe. But you know all that's not going to change is the crowd around you. He is still sitting in the middle of a crowd getting pressed into. His situation and the noise around him is still the same. Can I tell you something? When Jesus takes a hold of your life, you can set down all the control, you can set down all the fear, and yet, you know what's still gonna be happening around you? The world and culture and your life and your career and the noise of people telling you what to do and what to believe and how to deal with things. And the world is still gonna tell you you can deal with that with alcohol. You can drown that out with alcohol. You can drown that out with drugs. You can drown that out with an addiction. You can drown that out with pornography. You can drown that out with your friends. You can drown that out with your kids' softball teams. Like You can do whatever you want to fill that void and create as much noise as you want to create. But until you let go of that noise and hand that to Jesus, you're never going to see God move in your life. And they do not care about you. This world, they're going to chew you up and spit you out and they're going to move on to the next thing. And this is exactly where Jairus is. Look at the text. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except for Peter, James, and John and the child's mother and father. Meanwhile, all these people were wailing and mourning. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She's not dead, she's asleep. And they laughed at him knowing that she was dead, but he took her by the hand and said, my child, get up. Her spirit returned and at once they stood up and Jesus told them to give her something to eat and her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. See, in that day, In that time and space, they would hire professional mourners when a tragedy would happen. You're like, what does that have to do with anything, Nolan? Because they were not related and connected to this moment. And what you see what happens in this text. Some translations say that Jesus removed them from the house. Others, it tells them, he tells them to be quiet. It's the same result. There's noise happening. And Jesus said, if this little girl's gonna see life again, he has to remove the noise so that his parents or her parents can see and believe and hear clearly. If you want to hear God speak in your life, it's remove the noise. It's like the, the mourners is the same as our culture and our world around us. They don't care about you. Look what happens in the text. They're crying and they're mourning and she's gone. Hey, can you just do that out here? I'm... Um, I'm gonna do some work. I I don't need you to be a distraction. And what happens? Immediately, who are you? You think you're gonna heal this girl? They go from mourning to immediately scoffing. Why? Because they're not there for the miracle. This world, the moment you decide to change something or do something, they're gonna run after you, they're gonna chase after you, and as soon as you change your mind, they're gonna go after somebody else. And they're gonna start destroying you and lying to you and cheating you. And Jesus says, I don't need the noise. What are you listening to? What are the voices and the things in this world that you're listening to and allowing to speak into your life that are not the things of God? What are the things that you're so afraid of that you don't want to let anybody in your life to know about? Or do you think that Jesus doesn't know that he knows exactly what's going on? That you're trying to hold on to and keep control of? I think it's really interesting the way that this text ends. And I'm gonna end, and I want us to end here in this morning the same way. This scripture says, they got in the bedroom and Jesus says, <laughs> It says that he grabbed her by the arm and said, get up, arise, my daughter. 
Jesus calls the nation of Israel daughter several times as he relates to an entire nation. There's only one place in all scripture that he calls an individual daughter, and it's right here. He gets personal, he gets intimate, and he uses a statement that this little girl would have heard over and over and over. She's 12 years old. She goes to Capernaum Middle School. Every morning she would have heard this from her parents. Hey, baby girl, it's time to get up. Daughter, it's time to to get up and get ready. It's the same phrase that Jesus uses, but listen, he doesn't just speak It says he touched her. It says he he grabbed her arm. (laughs) When Jesus touches you, he heals you. When Jesus touches your life, he heals you. When he touches your soul, he heals you. And it may not be what you think you're asking for. And they may not be in the time frame that you think it's happening. It may not be the season of life you think it's going to happen. It may not be the answer you're asking for. You may be asking for one thing, and God says, I'm going to heal you, but I'm going to heal you the way that I want to heal you. I'm going to heal you in my timing. He didn't heal her when she was sick. He healed her when she was dead. But don't be mistaken, because that, the, the power of the hand of God is what heals. Our hands are nothing. Our hands have no power. Our words have no power. But if we will step into the authority of God and be a vessel of the Lord and believe in faith that he can heal through us, man, he can use you. He can use you in your workplace. He can use you in your home. He can use you in your family. He can use you right here. And so I'm gonna end this morning in a way that may be uncomfortable some of you. You don't have to make it weird. If you're visiting, if this is new, if you don't like praying over people, you don't have to. I'm not asking you to do something you don't want to do. But in just a minute, the band's going to come up, and they're going to play, and they're going to sing. And as they do, I want you to walk this room. Maybe it's someone in front of you. Maybe it's somebody behind you. Maybe it's somebody that God just says, I need you to go pray for that man in the red shirt. I don't know. But I want you to be obedient to the Spirit. To lay your hand on someone's shoulder and ask them, but in the power and the authority of the word of God that they would find courage and strength to let go of the control, the fear, and the noise in their life. And you don't have to know what those are. I'm just asking you to speak the word of God over them. 